All right, good to see you this morning. I can tell, I can tell that everybody is, is uh, high on Halloween candy. I've never heard so much chatter in my life. So, but thank you for coming, and it's great that we can fellowship together, that we can do life together, that we can be uh, in community together and, and uh, just be in relationships with one another. That's the way the Lord intends us to live out our Christian faith. He doesn't intend for us to try to do it on our own or be separated from everyone else, but he intends for us to do it together. So thank you for, gum, for coming, and it's good to hear the chitter-chatter this morning. So uh, just a couple of things. Uh, Noah Wana tonight, uh, and uh, we'll pick back up next week. This Wednesday, November 3rd, uh, we will have our family night at uh, Corn Dodgers Farm over in Headland. And uh, it'll be from 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, and what we really want you to do is invite a friend, invite a neighbor. Uh, there's no cost to this event. So we really want this to be a way that, number one, that you can have a good time with your friends and family. Your children can have a good time. But also we want people that maybe not go to Mount Gilead to be able to, to uh, uh, meet us and, and, and fellowship with us as well. So that'll be coming up November 3rd. All right. We're setting our clocks back. Is that when we get sleep or lose sleep? We get sleep. We lose sleep. I was having a good day until now. So, okay. Uh, so that'll be coming up next week. Uh, Young at Heart Thanksgiving meal November 9th is coming up as well. Uh, and then we got parent-child dedication November 14th. Uh, the youth have a ski retreat planned, and you can see information and details about that. Uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is uh, on Sunday, November the 7th, that should be next Sunday, okay, we are having a, a low country boil uh, retirement pot party in, in honor of uh, Brother Jim, uh, who has served here for years and years and years, and we just want to celebrate that service, okay. We uh, had this planned pre-COVID, and then... Uh, it just everything went haywire for about two years. So uh, anyway, we're we're back on track with that. That'll be next Sunday. So we'll have a low country boil here for uh, you guys. Uh, no cost to this event. All right. So, but the one thing that we are asking that you do is that you bring uh, a good dessert. So I mentioned apple pie last week. I also like those no bake cheesecakes. You know, the, where you throw the sour cream and the cream cheese together, and you make one of those. That's a great thing to bring as well. You just throw a couple of strawberries on there, and, and I'll be happy. So you can bring some of those um, uh, cookies or anything like that. <laughs> Heresy. Okay. Look, I'm fine with traditional, authentic New York style cheesecake as well, but. <laughs> No pressure there to the Miss Patty, okay? All right. Uh, so thank you guys for coming. At this time, um, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. James to come up. Mr. James is a, a volunteer for Sarcoa, and uh, we've been able to partner with them for uh, several, several months, uh, over a year now, I think. So Brother James, come on, and uh, they have a, a quick word to say. Thank you, bud. Like they said, I'm James Outler. I'm a 100% disabled veteran, and I volunteer year-round with SARCO. We build the wheelchair ramps. We build them all over from Eufaula to Andalusia, and that's a seven-county area. And believe me, in the last three years, I've been all over it. And now, let me tell you a little bit about SARCO. They are this area's agency on aging, such as the Council on Aging. And their mission is to offer support to senior citizens that doesn't have much, senior citizens that's disabled, and a lot of times to their caregivers. Okay, on my side, we build the ramps in this seven county area. And the motto of SARCOA is healthy, active, home life for the disabled and those that are approaching that, that actually needs the help. And if you've never went out in the community and tried to help in some type of community service project such as what we do, it's worth it whenever you see the look on their faces when they're actually getting a wheelchair ramp that will help them get out of their house and be more ambulatory in the community, which gives them more freedom. That look on their face is worth it all. Uh, 
SARCOA has informational and referral services, which includes applications for several assistance programs. And with follow-up support, SARCOA can assist you and your family in making all sorts of elder decisions. Now, I am a volunteer year-round, like I told you before. And during my years of being with SARCOA, I know I built over 30 ramps right by myself before we got to getting volunteers to come in to help. And otherwise, you know, the people that need these ramps, they're the people that cannot afford to go out and buy the material. Well, on a 40-foot ramp, it's going to cost between $900 and $1,100 just for the material. Okay, if they had to pay for the material and pay someone to come put it up, they're not going to eat that month. They're not going to have a doctor bill paid that month. So that, this is where we step in. All right. Now, on behalf of SARCOA, I'd like to recognize a special group of men within your church that has been volunteering with me to build these ramps for a little over a year now. And you've got one member that actually started helping me a little bit before that. At this time, I'd like to call Steve Butler up here with me. Is Steve Butler in the house? There he is. Come on up, Steve. Steve, if you just stand up here with me, you don't know how much I appreciate you and these men. Now, as I call these other names, if you would, just please stand where you're at, okay, and remain standing. Richard Bryant, David Graham, Mike Strickland, Mike Roberts, Michael Lawson, John Baxley, Andy Wells, Lamar Tidwell, Gary Reynolds, Danny Bush, Danny Williams, Mike Sheehy, and Mike Cotter. Have I overlooked anybody? I don't think so. All right, at this time, I have got, Mike, Michael, if you would just remain standing because we want to get you guys taken care of. I would like to present the men of the church, the men's group, with this certificate of appreciation. And it reads, in grateful recognition for your continuing community service and support, SARCO presents this Mount Gilead Men's Group with this Certificate of Appreciation on 31st day of October 2021, and it is signed by our Executive Director. So again, thank you for all that you do in our community. And I think we need to give these men a great hand of applause if you don't mind. Now, these men have made my life a lot easier. Brother Steve. I tried to get Mike to do this, and this sucker wouldn't do it. <laughs> we do have a list that we would be glad to put your name on. And we started out with uh, well, we just started out with uh, James, and so James is a great guy, but uh, he needs some help, and I realize that we, you know, in order to get five or six guys, you need about 20 or 30 on a list, and you just start calling, and you'll get what you need, so uh, just call me. 
call Michael, just call anybody. We'll put your name on the roster. And then when he calls me, we'll call you. And we get who we, we get all we can get. Uh, and, and he certainly appreciates it. But more than that, the people that we build the ramps for appreciate it because the need is there and uh, it's, it's worth the time. And generally, it only takes about a half a day and it's, it's worth every bit of the time. Now, you'll see some campers parked out here in about a week. We partnered with Sarcoa, coordinating the time with the fair where we'll be building ramps. They'll be using the lot. We'll be doing six ramps here during the fair. And campers on missions will be staying here again this year. And we put together a plan with them where we'll work the fair, carnival ministry. After the ministry that morning with the carnival workers, we'll come back here. And Michael's got some projects and then we'll go out with James and build these ramps. So just give us a call. We'll put you on the list. We'll, when James calls, we'll go build a ramp. Okay. I just like uh, making Mr. Steve uncomfortable. So. Uh, you know, so, you know, last week all on Facebook and on Wednesday night and everything, we've been talking about how can we better be the hands and feet of Jesus and how can we reach out and serve our community and how can we have gospel conversations with our community. Uh, so everything that our guys do with, with Sarcoa is meant to have gospel conversations with the people that we're helping, right? Sometimes we're able to do that. Sometimes we don't see them because they may not be able to come out or uh, or something like that, uh, but you know that's our goal when we're there is to, is to share the gospel and good news of Jesus Christ uh, with with whoever we're helping, and uh, it's just been a treat to uh, uh, be able to do that and uh, spend time with guys. And we usually go out and get us a lunch when we're done. And, uh, so, uh, point being is, as a church, we need to look for ways that we can be engaged in our community and and serving our community. So. Uh, we want to be a church where the main focus is not just what happens inside these walls, but what can we do outside the walls, you know, so uh, it's easy to throw up a shingle and tell everybody, hey, y'all come here, okay, uh, but to be honest, in, in, in the year we live in, that that's, just doesn't work anymore. We got to be the hands and feet of Jesus, and we got to be engaging our community, so look for ways that you could do that. It may be through Sarcoa. It may be through the harbor. We just went to the harbor yesterday. Uh, it may be you just taking time to notice a neighbor that needs something, okay? Uh, but be the hands and feet of Jesus. So I'm going to pray, and uh, let's worship uh, this morning. Father, we are uh, just so happy to be here this morning, and uh, we want to pause this morning and say that we need you in our life, and we need to hear from you. So, Lord, I pray that you would speak to us and mold us into the image of your Son and that you would challenge us this morning if we need challenging, if, if we need comfort. Lord, I pray that you would speak a word of comfort to us through your Spirit. And uh, as Brother Josh uh, and the praise team lead us, God, I pray that our hearts be captivated by you. And as our, uh, our children come and sing in just a moment, Lord, I pray that I pray we see past the cute faces to the message that they are proclaiming this morning. Uh, we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand together, church. And as we do that, we'll take a minute and uh, a few minutes and find somebody that you haven't spoke to this morning and tell them, uh, tell them good, good morning this morning.
Let's sing together, church. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. And How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. You guys sound good. Let's sing together. Bro. 
Lamb of God, worthy is your name. What do you think of when you say, sing that word worthy? You know that the word worthy is part of the root of the word worship in English. When we say, when we are worshiping, the idea is that we are expressing worship, the worthiness of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are singing of his great value in the great name of Jesus Christ. We tried to do that this week as we have focused on service and evangelism and we put a few things on Facebook. We talked about it a little bit last week. We're talking about it a little bit more this week and uh, it just helps us understand that Jesus is worth all that we are. He's worth all our tithes in terms of finances, when we are called to give that 10% and above that and offerings, he's worth our time, our service, our effort, he's worth our lives. And I pray that's what the world sees as they 
as they look at Mount Gilead and, and the, the church, not just Mount Gilead, but the church of Jesus Christ throughout the world. Our ushers are coming forward now as a part of our worship service. We express the worthiness of Christ through our giving. And so we give our tithes and our offerings as a reflection of the value that Christ um, displays in our own life, but of course also to accomplish the kingdom work that's right in front of us to go accomplish. Brother John's going to come. Would you come and you pray for us and pray over our offering, and uh, then we'll continue in our worship and our, as our children come to bless us. Like your haircut there, buddy. Baby. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your love and mercy and grace. Thank you for this time together where we have the opportunity to honor you, to worship you. We thank you for your love and kindness. God, bless these now as we take these tithes and offerings. I pray that you would bless them. Bless each one that gives this morning. Bless all that is given for your honor and glory. In Christ's name. I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever and ever, forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. On the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works I will meditate. They shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. The Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power. To make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful all his words and kind in all his works. You give life, you are love. Bye. 
Amen. And uh, what is more glorious than having our children remind us of how great the Lord is? Y'all like my new look? I thought it was cool. I, I did too. <laughs> Mr. Mr. Clean, that's right. But, <laughs> Andy's an eye doctor over there checking his glasses. I tell you, that's. <laughs> well, uh, we had fun last night, you know, I, I, I just put this on just to have uh, just a, a little bit of fun just for a moment. We went out uh, trick-or-treating with, with the kids, having, having a good time, and Misty and I dressed up, uh, Mr. Clean, I was Mr. Clean, had my white shirt on and took some muscle pictures, and Misty was the, my, my maid, and you know, we went out with friends dressed up and uh, all, all kind of different things. And uh, this morning, I actually had somebody, got a lot of people mentioned it to me this morning, and somebody actually asked me, were those your real muscles? <laughs> yes, they are. They were not quite as big as I would like. But the reason I kind of wore this to kind of get back, to get up here, especially is following our children, um, singing it, great, great is the Lord. Because what we want to talk about this morning is the fact that God uses ordinary people. And what's more ordinary than Mr. Clean and the maid, right? That's, uh, you know, Mr. Clean uh, sells cleaning supplies. That, that, that's, that's ordinary folks, right? God uses ordinary people. I want to introduce you to some ordinary people that, oh, dear Lord, I need some help. <laughs> All right, there we go. That was going to be weird if I had to preach that thing on. All right. Matthew chapter 10. As we are going to step out of our, our study in John just for this Sunday, as we think about just being used by God, or Matthew chapter 10, some ordinary people, Matthew chapter 10 verses 1 through 4, I want to read this, this is a, a list of the apostles that, the 12 apostles that Jesus called to follow him and to be trained by him and to be used by him. Let's stand to honor the reading of God's word. Matthew chapter 10, we're going to read verses 1 through 4 from the English Standard Version of the Bible. That's just the version that I use. You follow along with the version that you use. And after this, I'm going to get on my knees and I'm going to ask for God's grace in um, sharing a few thoughts out of this passage. I invite you to join me as the Lord gives you grace to do so. Or Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. Matthew tells us, he says, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. These names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, 
James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Would you pray with me? Father, we ask for grace now to be the people of God that you've called us to be. To be extensions of those apostles of whom you called out and who you equipped and who went with the gospel and changed the world. And Father, we are where we are because of their faith. Lord, we pray that lest the Lord comes back before, that people will be all the more zealous for the gospel of Jesus Christ because of our zealousness today. Father, we pray asking for you to encourage us this day through your word. I pray that the Holy Spirit might speak through me for the glory of your name. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Ordinary people. You know, ordinary people are not people that we usually want, want around. Uh, I mean, we, we usually need some specialists, right? When we, when we, we need some things, when, when uh, you know, when... When I'm, when I'm sick, I don't want an ordinary person. I want somebody that's been to medical school for years and years and years and an and, and, and internist or, um, you know, somebody that, that, can, that can speak to, to some, uh, some help. And then if I need even more help, I want them to send me to a, a specialist that's been to school even longer than that. And, and, and when scouts are looking for a, 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 to, to recruit for their team and and what do they do? They don't go to the, the poor, ordinary teams. No, they go look at the teams and the players who are the best of the best to bring up to the pros. They go look at the best college teams or the, the, best, uh, the very best of the high school players to, to play. We're, we're looking for the best of the best. People with unique talents and skills. That's who we want. It's interesting, though, that when God called Jesus to come to earth to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ, to, to spread the kingdom of God, to save sinners. We might think that, that he would choose the same, the brightest, the best of the best, those with uh, the most renowned religious insight, those religious men of, the, of his time that were most well known. But he doesn't. What does he do? He just calls to himself a bunch of nobodies. I mean, these men... They're not famous. They've not written any books. No one's heard of them. They're not religious leaders. They're nobodies. They're nobodies. And yet that's who he calls. And that's who he changed the world with. Ordinary people. Bunch of nobodies. What can we learn from that? How did he use these men? How, did he, how does he use ordinary people? People. Well, I would say it in, in three points, three ways. That, that God calls ordinary people first to walk with him. That God calls ordinary people to walk with him. You know, these are guys that I think we can identify with. They're real people. They're like us. They're like people we know. They're not outstanding in any area of, of natural talent or special intellectual abilities. You know, just the opposite. They're always making mistakes. They're always messing things up. They're always acting in, in faithless ways. You've got, I mean, I mean, some of them actually have nicknames like Doubting Thomas or, um, or, or you have Peter in his very famous foot-shaped mouth. You know anybody else that has a, a foot-shaped mouth? Ladies, stop poking your husbands, all right? They're, yeah, of course. They, he's always messing things, things up, always showing faithlessness and doing things wrong and when Jesus found them, I mean, they were so eclectic. He's doing all kinds of different things. I, I like the, the guy before Judas, next to the last guy in this particular list is Simon the Zealot. Became an apostle. The Zealot. He'd been part of a, a radical political group that was trying to overthrow the Roman rule in Israel. And then there's Matthew, a tax collector that Jesus would call to follow him. A tax collector. You talk about people that are not popular. I mean, tax collectors are not even popular today, much less back then. I mean, back then, they were people who, who had really, in some ways, sold their soul to the Romans to, to 
take taxes from uh, the, the people of God and, and then give them to the Romans and, and then take anything extra for themselves. Oh my goodness, he was not a popular man whatsoever. And, and then at least four of the seven of them were fishermen from Capernaum, probably close friends that had grown up together. The others here were some type of tradesmen or, or craftsmen, just ordinary folks, folks just like you. You know, I look around here, look at me. I don't see a lot of folks that were trained in many Ivy League towers, schools. Oh, sure, you've got some special gifts and, and uniquenesses about you. I mean, we've got, we've got plumbers and farmers and teachers. We even got a, a lawyer and a doctor, doctor or two. But you know what? We're just ordinary folks. Folks that God has called out to be used, that God has called out to, to serve and, and that love God. Just ordinary people doing ordinary things. <laughs> you might say, well, you know, I don't know that that was the smartest thing for Jesus to do. I mean, these guys did make a lot of mistakes. He had a lot of trouble out of those, these guys that, that he had to fix. Well, maybe he should have spent a little more time thinking about who he was choosing. You know what he did do? He spent all night praying, all night praying to the Father about, about who he would call. Look at Luke chapter 6, verse 12. We'll put it on the screen. It says, in these days he went out to the mountain to pray. And all night he continued to pray to God. All night he prayed about who his apostles would become, who they would be. When's the last time you prayed all night about anything? Mind you, this is the second person of the Trinity. This is God himself communing with God, the Father, about who these men would be. This is sovereign God praying, communing with sovereign God. All-knowing God who knew, who knew everything about everything about the way this thing would unfold, and yet he still prayed passionately, diligently to the Father. So, understand that when Jesus called these men to be his apostles, he knew all their faults. He knew all their failures. He knew where all their warts were. He knew Peter would lie about knowing him before the crucifixion. He knew about Thomas's doubts. He, he even knew that Judas, Judas would betray him. And you know what? That will be encouraging to each and every one of us. Because I think we all need to be encouraged by the fact that Jesus wants us to know that we're not disqualified from walking with God because of our pasts. He knows we're just ordinary folks. As a matter of fact, the Bible talks about ordinary people. All people are Ordinary. Matter of fact, all people are less than ordinary. The Bible says all people are sinners. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death, that we're all under the condemnation of God. That's why Jesus came. That's why Jesus came, was to save ordinary people. People who are fallen, people who are broken, people with warts, people who are, who, who are rebels from God, who are separated from God, who are wallowing in sin, people who need God to come for us and to save us. And that's exactly what he did. As a matter of fact, you might say that not only does, G, that does our past not disqualify us from walking with Jesus, but it's because of our past that Jesus came at all. He came because he loved us. He wants to redeem us. He does redeem us, and he's creating a church for himself. And these 12 men that Jesus prayed over all night, just like us, all sinners in need of a Savior. And they have a Savior. And God's going to use these broken men. He's going to save them. And he's going to change the world through them. So God calls ordinary people to walk with him. But also, God trains ordinary people to work with him. Let's spend some time thinking about how Jesus trained his disciples. You notice that as you read through the Gospels, we see that they all got the same basic training. 
Uh, he, he knew that all of them, and some of them more gifted in some ways than, than other ways, but all of them would need that basic training of what it means to, to know Christ, to walk with Christ, and then be used by Christ to, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, the, the, the good news of what it means that, gospel, that Jesus came to heal us and to restore us back to God. Now, how did he do this? Well, of, of course, he, he, he did it through teaching them to trust him, that by faith, they would be made right with God. That's the very essence of the gospel. And so the gospel teaches us to turn from sin and put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then it teaches us to allow the Holy Spirit to change us. And, and it's incumbent upon us to look at the person that we now represent as Christians and then seek to live like Christ, seek to speak like Christ, to, to represent Christ uh, as if Christ was here living through us, because in a, in a very real way, he is. And so I think Jesus shows him, you, you, you think like me, you talk like me, you treat people like me. It's why Jesus would say things like, like this in John 13, 34, and 35. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. That you love. That you love. That that's what marks the gospel. That's what marks the church. That's what marks service. That's what marks evangelism. That's what marks worship. What? Love. Love for God. Love for each other. Just as I love, have loved you, you are to also love one another. Why? Because by this, all people will know that you are my disciples. That you are mine. That you have been saved by me. You have been changed by me. You, you're trusting in me and in me alone to make you right with God. You are restored by me. That you are taught by me. That you are mine. How? If you love one another. A church, a movement, a gospel, a people. Marked by one overarching attribute that informs everything else. The love of God flowing from ourselves to each other and to the world. If you're going to be disciples of God, then you're going to have to reflect his character. Because if we don't, then the words we, have, we share and the actions that we do will have really no power in the world. Because we realize that, that people who say one thing and act another way will just have words that fall on deaf Years. And so he taught them. He taught them. He basic training. He taught them to pray. He taught them to serve. He taught them to forgive uh, one another. He taught them to care for each other with humility. He made them instruments. And they went out and they healed the sick by the power of God. They cast out demons. They did all manner of mir miraculous works. And, and three of them even got a little bit more than basic training on the mountain of transfiguration. You'll remember that story when, when uh, Jesus brought uh, Peter and James and John up on the mountain of transfiguration. I'm not going to go through all, all that story, but I think what a beautiful picture that God the Father shows up. And, and for a brief glimpse of time, the humanity of Christ was unzipped so that the divinity of Christ could be seen in the glory of Christ. So pronounced in that mo moment. And then the, the father speaks and says, this is my son. This is my son. You listen to him. You learn from him. You be shaped by him. You be moved by him. You let him give you purpose in life. That's what that training looked like. Now, we might push back on that and go, well, I understand that, preacher, but, you know, I'm not, I'm not in their shoes. You know, I really hadn't been a Christian all that long, and I hadn't made it through all the, quote, basic training that you're talking about. Maybe I hadn't been saved long enough or I hadn't spent enough time with, with, with Jesus, and I don't want to go and be served by God or, or get in gospel conversations and, and then get put in a situation I'm not ready to handle. It's just, get, just give me a little more time. Well, I've often said, and, and I'll keep saying, that if you know Jesus, you know enough to tell somebody else about Jesus. If you know him. If you know him. Now, if you know the word, but if, if you're familiar with the word, but you don't know Jesus, you might struggle. All right? 
And look, evangelism is a challenge. I put my devotion this week was on that very thing that, that um, you know, as me, you might think, well, Bradley's a great evangelist. Bradley's not a great evangelist. I'm a decent teacher. hope I'm a decent preacher. You know, we lead, administrate, and those kind of things. But, but I struggle with evangelism. I, I always have. And, and what I just said was, look, that doesn't give us a pass. Because Paul told Timothy, go do the work of the evangelist. Whether you have that giftedness or not, go do the work. Go do the work. You're right. If you know Jesus, you know enough to share, some, to share about Jesus with someone else. It doesn't take that much time, really. And it's okay if you get caught in a situation that you get a question you can't answer. You say, you know what? I don't know the answer to that question, but I do know the Savior of the world. And he's changed my life. Right? Doesn't, it's not about time. It's not about degrees. It's not about seminary. It's not about how long you've been in Sunday school. It's not about how long you've been a member of a church. Do you know Jesus? Do you know enough to share Jesus? You know, the uh, disciples, they didn't have all that time long with Jesus. As Jesus ministered three years. Three years. And did you know by the time that Jesus actually called all of his disciples and actually began to train them, he really only had them 18 months under training. 18 months! That's significantly less than a, a college bachelor's of science degree. That's less than, uh, and that's, that's, that's half the time that most preachers spend in seminary. It's nothing. But who did they know? They knew Jesus. And that was enough for Jesus to be able to trust them to take his gospel and change the world. It's enough for us, too. And so that brings us to this third point here. That, yes, God calls ordinary people to walk with him. And he trains ordinary people to, to work with him. And also God empowers ordinary people to witness for him. As I mentioned to you, that 18 months, it doesn't sound very long it sounds like a dangerous plan doesn't it I mean in, in a moment for a moment there it looked like it was going to be a disastrous failure when you look at the cross and after Judas had betrayed him the disciples abandoned him you look at the cross who's around Jesus at the cross thankfully some faithful women were and John same John that wrote the gospel that we're studying most Sundays and John all the other those Ordinary people, well, they showed a bit of their ordinariness. They got scared just like most of us would have been. It wasn't until we get to Acts 2, Pentecost. And Peter's there, that same Peter with that foot-shaped mouth who had denied Jesus three times who had fled from Jesus, who had really, in, in many ways, one way to understand what the Scripture is saying, had cursed his name. And here he finds himself now, when the Holy Spirit fell upon that place, empowered by God to stand up at Pentecost and to preach, and to preach in such a way that some 3,000 people were saved. What's the difference between that Peter and the Peter who had betrayed Christ? Or that Peter and, and, and the Peter constantly uh, sticking his foot in his mouth, pointing to himself instead of pointing to Jesus. What's the difference? I'll tell you the difference. The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit had fallen upon that, that place. And now this instrument... You see, it's like, you know, think about this, this, this instrument. And these instruments are, look at all these different instruments. They're, they're wonderful, beautiful instruments. Let's, let's listen to the drums. Hmm. What about the guitars? Huh. What about the piano? I bet the piano's got, got it's, you know, it's been around a long time. I bet it can make some beautiful music. Josh, I think something's wrong with these instruments, man. Brother Danny, they were fine when you had them. Josh came and they don't even play anymore. I mean, what's the deal, man? No, because what? Because instruments don't play themselves. 
instruments have to have an instrumentalist. And then, yeah, every instrument has a unique sound and a un even a uniqueness amongst itself. But when an instrument is played, you know what you're hearing more than the instrument? You're hearing the instrumentalist. You're hearing the giftedness and the talent, the uniqueness, and the power, if you might, what might, of the person that's playing it. And the same is true when God takes ordinary people just like an instrument doesn't, it's not a lot of use unless it has a gifted instrumentalist behind it. It's kind of like this glove. Some of you would say, well, I can't be used, Bradley. I'm just, I'm just man, I'm like this glove. That glove don't, don't, don't do a whole lot. I just really don't have anything to offer. I don't know of any gifts or abilities or talents. Or I just, you know, I'm not trained. I just... But then God picks up an ordinary glove. And I pick up this ordinary glove and I put my hand in it. Now what can this glove do? It can do anything I can. Ladies and gentlemen, no matter how ordinary you think you are, when God puts his hand on you, you can do anything God wants you to do. Because it's his power doing it in you, not you. Apostle Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Now the life I live in the flesh, I, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. It's Jesus that lives through me. It's Jesus that uses us. It's Jesus that empowers us. It's why I'm able to say every week that we are sent. We have the gospel. Let's go change the world. It's not because there's anything unique about us that makes us different from the world outside of the fact that we have been called by God, that we are equipped by God, that God's hand is on us, that Christ lives in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now, just like God took 12 ordinary men and changed the world, what if God took a church of some two, three, four hundred ordinary people who were willing to be used by God, what could he do for the next hundred years? He could change the world. For the next thousand, he could change the world. Continue it to. That's what he's called us to do. And I want to close with this. This is a real good, helpful exercise every morning to get you ready in, in that way. And I didn't come up with this. I, I, uh, I don't even know where I heard this, but I've used it over the years. It's been helpful to me. It is this an acronym, PACE. When you get up every morning, you're going to do your, your quiet time, just kind of get your heart ready. It's an acronym of P-A-C-E. The P stands for, you just kind of open your hands up and say, you know, Lord, I, I praise you for who you are. You just get up in the morning, I just praise you for, for, for you for who you are. You know, the psalmist said, from the rising of the sun to going down the same, I'll praise your name forever. So, I, Lord, I just start the day, I praise you. And you just kind of turn your hands in for an A, and you say, Lord, Lord, I accept I accept all that you are into all that I am today. I am ordinary. I am sinful. But you are righteous. You are holy. You are powerful. And I'm a child of God. And I'm going to own that. I'm going to own that. And then the C stands for control. Now, Lord, I just give control of my life to you today. Miss Patty called me this week. We had a conversation. I, I may, have you already shared that with your people? All right, I'm not going to share it. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to share it. That was too good. It was your insight. All right, I'm going to share it. It's good. But, 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 but she, she said this. Matter of fact, you want to, you want to say it? And that, no, you don't want to say it. Okay, that, that's fair enough. You know, just this, just, now what was it, Miss Patty? I'm going to make you share it. It's yours. Y'all hear that? And I'll, I'll repeat it so many people here. And what she said was is that if we're faithful to the word and obedient to God, then in most of the situations we find ourselves, most of our choices are already made. 
yeah, that if we, that if we love God. And I just, I just thought about that. I thought, that is so good. Because how many times have you been in a situation and you go, well, well what do I do here? What, what, what should I do here? And the real question is, is what does God desire of you in this moment? If you're picking a spouse, you should, should I date this person? Should I not? Well, are they a believer? That's what the Word of God says. Are they seeking to please God with their life? You know, so if, if you are answering that question, I'll, it may not answer that if, if this specific person, but I'll tell you this, it'll call a lot of other people, right? And so I just mentioned that when we talk about control, that, Lord, I am yielding control of my life to you. Should I share the gospel this, with this person? I have an opportunity to do that. I see this opening here. I'm a little bit scared. Should I do that? Not even a question. The Bible says you share the gospel, right? You'll control. And then the E stands for, I expect you to do great things today. And so well, that's really one of the wonderful things about being a believer, that every morning when you get up and you go out into the world, you can be amazed at what God will do through you. Lord, I expect you to work through me today as I'm faithful, realizing that I have a unique opportunity as this ordinary person saved by grace, made a child of God, to walk with God, to be trained by Christ, and to be used by God to change the world. Oh, that God would make us faithful just like these 12 ordinary people. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that Jesus didn't come looking for the best and the brightest and these religious leaders and all this in order to, to change the world, but he could use anybody, and he did. And it just reminds us, Father, that we're not particularly special because of who we are. We're, we're made special because of who you are and what Christ has done. And Lord, we, we have a big task at hand, a big calling a scary one, one that if we look at ourselves, we go, we can't do, we can't accomplish, it's too much. Lord, I pray that you'll remind us that you never, you, you called ordinary people so we wouldn't get the glory for it, that you get the glory for what you do through us because it's only by your power that, that anything of kingdom accomplishment kingdom work is, is done in the world and so father I'm asking you father now the same power that created the church by the gospel of Jesus Christ and place repentance and faith in us to believe that that faith by the power of the Holy Spirit would, would send us out to be used and to be change agents in the world just like these 12 ordinary men, that this 200 plus ordinary people in this room might go into our ordinary situations with an extraordinary gospel that would change people's lives as you have changed ours. If you're here this morning and, and you need Christ as your Savior, then I encourage you right now, just call upon Him. He'll save you. Just like He saved us, He'll save you. Say, Lord, I need you. I'm lost. I'm separated. I'm sinful. I recognize that I need forgiveness. And I believe that Jesus, he lived for me, that he went to the cross, he bore my sin, he died for me, he rose again, overcoming that sin and death so that I might have his life. And I believe right now, I believe upon you, Lord. I trust you. If that's you, the Lord, the, the, the word of God says he saves people with that type of faith. We're going to sing a hymn of invitation here if you want to. Uh, let that be known. If you want some more counseling in that direction, Brother Mike will be down front, I'll be down front. We'll be happy to pray for you and to give you some counseling, what it means to take first steps toward walking with Christ. Maybe you're here and you just go, you know, the Lord's been wanting to use me in a few situations and I've just not, I've been hesitant, I, I've been scared. But I'm going to be scared no longer. Ask the Lord to give you strength and power and courage to be used. Father, we, we turn to you now. We thank you. Use us, we pray. Save the lost. Save the world. 
use your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together, church. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend. The agonies of Calvary. You, the perfect Holy One, crush your son. You drank the bitter cup reserved. Thank you so very much for being here with us today and worshiping with us today. I uh, want you to enjoy your, your evening today. We, we don't have Awana tonight, correct? No, no Awana tonight. Tonight's a, a family night for you to enjoy uh, some family time, and uh, we pray that you will do just that. And we'll be back uh, this coming week, Wednesday and Sunday, worshiping together, fellowshiping together. We want you to come and, and join us. Uh, if you're a guest with us today, thank you so very much for uh, worshiping with us. I want to meet you. I would love to uh, get to know you more. I'm going to be back at this door out to the left. Uh, just, just come over there and, and, and say, uh, hey, preacher, I'm, I'm so-and-so, and I'd like to get to know you a little bit better. All right. Um, the person I was supposed to pray I could not be here this morning, so I'm going to ask Brother Josh, if you would, to, uh, to close us out. And as we do, I'll remind you, we're not dismissed, but we are. We have the... Let's go change the world. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you for what you've done in and through us, Father, to uh, redeem us, to make us one with you, Father, that we might uh, proclaim your excellencies and proclaim your, uh, your greatness and your grace and your mercy. And, uh, Father, we pray that we would do that with our lives.
Father, we pray that we would share our story and that you'd be faithful to work in and through us. Encourage us. Build your church. And we thank you and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.